so it's been a while since I've updated and a lot of things have happened obviously but since tonight I really wanted to raise some awareness on gastroparesis I wanted to focus on that as you can see I have no makeup on and I'm in jammies as usual because I've spent most of the day not feeling very good but I had a spectacular evening the other day seeing 10th Avenue North it was amazing back to the awareness I'm working on a series of awareness videos this is just the first one that I wanted to do because it's the most important to me. It's mainly uh, about pregnancy and gastroparesis and short gut and all that stuff because most doctors, at least if you have it to the severity that I do, do not recommend it. And I was told that I would never be able to get pregnant and Sure enough, we found out on July 12th that we were that we were eight weeks pregnant after I had just gotten released from the hospital a few weeks earlier on vancomycin, and my husband had asked, you know, if we should be concerned. And sure enough, uh, the resident said, "You can't get pregnant, so there's no point worrying. You can't." provide nutrition to this child, you the baby would die before it would ever make it to to term or to to even recognize as a baby, I guess, in their medical jargon. Well, I was sicker than usual and I was vomiting, just smelling food. And imagine going to the doctor and telling your doctor that you're sicker than usual, that you're vomiting more and that you're sick to your stomach more and she looks at you and says you're always sick to your stomach but it was the case and I finally got her to do a pregnancy test after she argued with me and argued with me and argued with me that there was no way that I was pregnant well she called me later on July 12th 2010 and informed me that I was pregnant and she was my reaction was just to sit down on the couch and just go you know the reaction of most pregnant girls and her reaction was I'm calling all these doctors and I'm calling the high-risk doctor and I'm setting up all these tests and I don't know what we're gonna do and I don't know how we're gonna do this and blah 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 and it became a big ordeal and so we went to our first appointment and this would be I don't know how well you can see but I'm gonna show you some anyway I tried to block out the light these would be our first ultrasounds. Um, that tiny one right there is our very first little peanut when he was eight weeks old. After that ultrasound, after I saw that little peanut, they took me in a room, a bunch of doctors and nurses and, and Josh, and told me that I should terminate the pregnancy, that I should... Um, I was only eight weeks along and that it was perfectly fine to end the pregnancy and it would be best for my health if I did that. And I had been praying my whole life to be a mom and they were telling me that I wasn't going to be a mom, that they, were, they wanted me to kill my child. And I know that there's a lot of mixed beliefs on this, but let's just put it forward. I am, I am pro-life through and through you want to hate me or write hater comments fine but that's my belief uh, and I you know all I wanted was a baby and they sat us in a room for three hours and kept telling us you know you're gonna die you're never gonna survive this pregnancy this 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 fetus, they kept calling it a fetus, and I kept getting very angry. 
uh, and they said this fetus is going to kill you you already can't feed yourself you're on TPN which is the stuff that goes through here um, and all this and it's it's just horrible you're gonna die and the baby's gonna die or the baby will live and you'll die or vice versa or you'll both die and you know just basically the word die kept getting thrown around they even tried to turn my husband against me at one point and they and they said do you really want to have do you really want to lose your your wife and all that and he stepped in and said that he would never ever take my choice away from me so we began the very long long nine month journey to having our son. It started out immediately with me being diagnosed with gestational diabetes because I was on TPN which is given for gastroparesis when your guts are pretty much useless like mine are. So that was immediately dangerous for the, me and the baby but they couldn't do anything about it till I was out of my first trimester so I was watched very closely and put on meds for blood sugar problems and obviously told to take it easy and I have four stepchildren that I wanted that I that were very young at the time and and I I like it was so long ago it was four years and I wanted to still be a good mom to them and everything else I didn't want to slow down but I had to and then at at 12 not even 12 11 weeks we went in and they had decided that they were going to take my central line out which was like this but different it was a different kind of line and they were going to stop my TPN and start tube feeding they had to put a tube in which meant major abdominal surgery it's major on a pregnant woman to, to be digging around in her guts and we went in there and I was a complete wreck and I told them to not hurt my baby and it was it was the most scariest moment I can ever imagine I can't explain it to you I woke up from anesthesia and my first reaction was is the baby okay is the baby okay is the baby okay and they kept telling me the baby was fine and they were trying to give me meds and I kept telling them I was fine I wasn't fine so they kept you know pushing meds anyway and finally they took me to ultrasound and they showed me a moving baby and a heartbeat and everything else so I was okay with that and then came the hard part starting tube feed which the reason I was on TPN is because I had rejected tube feed it makes me massively ill and causes extraordinary pain there was no choice the baby needed the nutrition so the only thing that could be done was what the doctors decided to do was put me on narcotics to get this baby to size and they planned to put him in NICU when he was born if he needed to withdraw from the meds and imagine being a mom and knowing that you're putting this in your body and that it's da endangering your child's life and the first thing I said is I said I'm gonna have my baby in the NICU and everyone's gonna think that I am a crackhead and that I don't love my baby and I do I don't want this but the problem is, is I couldn't function, I couldn't hardly stop crying when they didn't use the pain meds. So they had to do it, and I wouldn't let them increase them, I wouldn't let them do anything. I sat in bed rest for, I think it was six months, torturing my husband, torturing him a lot. Because gastroparesis and the shortcut, the thing is, is that your guts they understand that they don't process food but your brain and the baby hormones they don't get that so I was like for the first time in my life mind you with the anorexia and all that I was always scared of of high fat foods and scary foods and particularly afraid of Big Macs I had never had one in my life 
25 years had never had a Big Mac. And I called my husband on his way home from work and I said, I need a Big Mac. And all he could do was say, oh, 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 okay, honey. And that went on and on. And the thing is, is I would take one bite and be done. And I would be sick or in pain. And my poor husband gained 70 pounds during my pregnancy. And I didn't gain, like, anything except the baby. He got over it. Don't worry. But... Um, we're gonna bounce forward because it really, bed rest is boring. It makes you mean because you can't do anything and it makes you worry extremely extra. I'm sorry, this itch is really bad. It makes you worry extremely extra about your baby. I kept poking at him because I thought he wasn't okay. I thought for sure, you know, all this doomsday stuff that they were telling me was going to happen. And I was trying to push through the pain and I was trying to do everything I could to make this baby come out more than what they said. They had predicted that even at, even at full term he would be a preemie sized baby because I wasn't gaining weight. Because I wasn't absorbing the nutrition as well as to be expected. Well, on February 17th, 2011, we went in for our... We went by. We went twice a week to have. I had a biophysical profile every every week, which was where they did an ultrasound to check his growth and his breathing and his heart rate and all that stuff. And I would do an NST, which is a non-stress test, to look for any worsening contractions or anything like that. Well, we went in that day and didn't think anything of it. Went in there and got hooked up to monitor and was ready to look at pictures of my baby. And the... I knew the ultrasound tech well. She had been taking care of me my whole pregnancy and I have ultrasounds from like weekly. And she got this look on her face that did not hide the panic that she was supposed to hide and she said flat out she said I have to go call the doctor she said baby's not moving baby's not breathing baby's not doing anything but having a heartbeat she goes we have to call the doctor and we're gonna go down and you're probably gonna be monitored and it's gonna be fine blah 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 so we went down there we went to admitting and we thought we were being admitted to the short stay maternity place and it turns out that uh, when we got in the room and sat down it said Andrea stat C and I was immediately like what we're having a stat C section now I will, and, and immediately, like, I know this is totally off GP topic and, like, my miracle baby, but, like, my, my brain went, no! As, as pregnant as I was, because by the grace of God, I made it to 38 weeks and two days. Which was a miracle. Nobody thought we would make it, and we made it. And... And all of a sudden, I was not ready to have this baby, and we were not prepared. It had been snowing and blizzards, and it was, oh, it was Missouri, crazy Missouri weather. And my husband, they rushed me from the lab to the maternity ward because, to labor and delivery, because I had been taking too long to get up there. And they came down and got rushed me up there to hook me up to monitors. And my husband went to the gift shop to try to get a camera because ours was haha <laughs> at home. And nobody thought, hey, we have smartphones. Um, <laughs> but uh, my husband ran uh, when they didn't have them in the gift shop. My husband ran to the grocery store, which was like a block and a half away and bought a camera and he also bought himself lunch and some drinks 
before we went in there and they delivered the baby because there was there was some ideas as to whether or not we were going to wait or I was going to be like under anesthesia or if they were going to be able to do the spinal block or all that they just weren't sure and they were trying to wait for my doctor and praise God we were able to wait the two hours uh, Damien started moving and so finally at about 11.55 she came in and she said so we're having a baby today and and I was so scared and I walked in there and and my husband couldn't come with me which was hard but um, but they took us in there and this would be the pre-baby me sitting there wondering what's going on and I know it's backwards because I didn't flip the screen and there's me on the table after I had my anesthesia and at 12.34 p.m. Damien Lee Pershing Taylor I don't know if you can see that cute little guy right there was born into this world weighing in at six pounds ten ounces which would be two to three pounds bigger than they thought he would be and he was nineteen inches long he was a big one, and I was strapped to a table crying because I couldn't see him my husband got to see him my husband got to go and do all the fun stuff he cut the cord and there was little baby in his nursery getting warmed up this was the first time I held my son this was me on my way to postpartum and this is the first time I actually held my son which was over an hour after he was born because I had to sit in recovery and from having so many surgeries I kept telling them that I was fine I kept saying oh no 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 I kept saying I'm fine I'm fine I can go I'm good let's go let's go I want to see my baby let's go let's go let's go let's go and they kept telling me no and come to find out I was really sick and they didn't want to tell me because I I don't know why they didn't want to tell me if they didn't want to bum the new mom out or scare the new mom but the baby had literally done what they said he would do he had depleted me of everything he had taken every store I had the baby had has essentially pro he progressed my illness a lot quicker than anything else and you know there was a lot of I told you so and I said it's well worth it I said if I live 10 years with this beautiful child as opposed to you know 20 years without him I am more than blessed to have this baby in my life and uh, I was I was blessed I even he had colic never slept never never did any of that but he was always always a happy little boy this is him growing perfectly normal he was growing trying to crawl doing all that fun stuff that they do at that age everybody had so many misconceptions about this everybody thought that he and I were just not gonna make it and I look at this smile every day and I think how could I have have not had this in my life I mean I've watched my baby grow from I mean here's a little bit of his scrapbook that he's grown he's grown from this little screaming baby uh, getting cleaned up by the doctors to this little guy right here playing and to this little guy you know crawling around and trying to walk in a walker and it's just I can't imagine my life without him and GP and the shortcut and the motility and it's all makes you high risk because your baby needs to eat but my baby saw his first Christmas 
My baby sat on Santa's lap. My baby saw his family on Christmas. Things that I never thought that I would say, my baby did. You know, he was a rock star at seven months old. And his nickname is Rockstar because he was born to the song Rockstar and he was throwing up the Rockstar sign when he was born. And the most monumental day I could possibly say was the day that he was turned one years old because they told us that he was never ever going to be, they told us that it was never going to be. They told us we were dead, that we were never ever going to be. And that's my one year old little man eating his chocolate cake and loving it. He has celebrated every Easter, every Christmas. He's loved by so many people. He has a great daddy. Like, I can't even explain the blessings that I've had in my life because of this little boy. We've had amazing you know times together and sick times together where mommy and baby were sick he's had to go through so much so much and still has a special time with his dad to keep him safe when mom has to go to the hospital and he has gotten so much bigger than this but we're a family and if this is what it means to be a family that we rough it through these times I don't care I don't care those doctors people email me all the time and they talk to me about like because the, they're GP patients and shortcut patients and motility patients and they want to have babies and I can't be a doctor I can't tell you whether you should or you shouldn't I just know that I was gonna die they said I was going to die, but yet I had this miracle inside of me that was never supposed to be, and he's my GP miracle. This is his, um, this is his second birthday. It was amazing. He fell asleep like little Joker. And you know there's a lot of consequences to having GP and having babies because you still have to go to the hospital, you still have to go to the you still have to have surgeries and you still have to have all that. My son had to go had to go stay with his go stay with very close friends um who he would, who he considers his aunt and uncle for two months because I had to have a surgery. I spent a month in the hospital and I had an open incision in my abdomen from the surgery that I couldn't take care of him. He's grown up with this stuff hanging off. He doesn't touch it. He doesn't mess with IV poles. He doesn't do anything like that. He doesn't know the difference. He doesn't know the difference between my GJ tube that I've got right here. He doesn't know anything about that. He just knows I'm mommy. He doesn't care on the days that the GP hits me and I'm throwing up in the toilet and I'm crying and I'm upset and I don't feel good and I'm hurting and I and the pain meds aren't working and I'm a, and you know all that stuff. It, it, he still wants mommy. And it's hard, you know, when your son is used to coming to the hospital, that he's used to coming to run up into the hospital and see mommy because that's where mommy is, fighting infections or whatever, climbing up in the hospital bed, grabbing a blanket and laying down. He has done all those things. The nurses all know him here at the, at the local hospital. He's known in the ER. He's never been turned away. He's never been treated differently, but he has has had to deal with a lot of stress because going to bed at night waking up and your mom has been you know taking an ambulance because there was an emergency when my kidneys shut down or, or when I started throwing up blood or 
anything like that or, or I spiked a fever and he wakes up and mom's gone that's caused problems I'm not gonna lie it's hard it's hard to be a, a GP mom it's hard to be a GP family because my husband is not only you know trying to take care of our child with me and be in a marriage but he's also taking care of me so it takes a kind of toll on everything we made vows to one another so no matter how mean I get or how tired he gets of th cleaning up vomit whether it be mine or the baby's we stick together he's there in the ER whenever he can be if he doesn't have to work or he's not chasing our son around he's doing the best he can it's hard to be a caregiver for somebody who's sick and for a severe GP and short gut patient to carry a baby to full term on pain medication on a tube that barely absorbed and have a baby come out perfectly healthy my son was on narcotics for his whole pregnancy and did not have an ounce of it in his system and that I attribute to God I believe my son is a miracle I truly do because he beat the odds at every single corner every time they told us no every test they told us no every surgery they told us no we both survived they told me going into surgery for my tube when they took my line out they were doing it at the regular hospital because if the ba if we lost the baby there was nothing to be done anyway the baby would die and they tell this to a 11 week pregnant mother who's already out of her mind so what I can tell you is that this is my first video on gastroparesis awareness and it's based towards moms who have GP and want to have a baby or do have babies and do understand what it's like to be dead tired and have to get up and chase them around or get up in the middle of the night when you're so tired and so much pain or you've been throwing up all night but you still have to do it because your your babies don't care they just want their mamas and you do that and people don't know you know they don't see you as the unsung hero that you are they don't see you as more than just an ordinary mother and you are so if you're watching this as a GP mom don't let anybody ever lessen what you do because I dare somebody to have the stomach flu every single day of their life to be hooked up to God and everything and still with backpacks and poles and everything else still make sure your baby's fed cleaned carried loved on snuggled if they throw up, if they poop on you, all of it, you are devoting yourself to them. Don't ever let anybody take that away from you because you're brave. You're brave. And I know there's days that you don't want to do it. And I know there's, not that you don't want to be a mom, that you don't want to be their mom, but there's days when you're laying down in bed and don't, and believe me, there's days I'm laying here and I'm like, and I hear him come in and I look at the clock and it's like five and I'm like no and I want to just start crying but then I think about how blessed I am to have my son because they told me for years that I would never have a baby and I'm 29 years old and I have this beautiful four-year-old and it is hard because I can't have any more I'm too sick it's a guarantee that I will die. I mean, we prayed and prayed and prayed before we agreed to let them go in and make sure that there would be no more babies. And it was the hardest decision of my life, and it is still hard on me. I cry a lot.
it's been hard because at my age all my friends are having their second and third babies and I would give anything to have more babies in my house to hold another baby to be pregnant again but not to be so afraid and it's not fair for me to do that to Damien my little boy is the most beautiful little boy to me he is a miracle we named him Damien because he's the patron saint of lepers, of outcasts, in hopes that he will grow up to not judge people because of what they have hanging off of them, or if they don't have a leg, or if they're on oxygen, or if they're different in any way, that they're still a child of God, and that he is put here to be their friend at least and if he is able to go forward and help people in some way when he's older whatever he wants to do I'm just proud that he's alive he's alive to do anything in the world and I think that's a miracle so please if you've managed to stick with my story here I'm asking that you raise awareness for gastroparesis because there are so many of us who are fighting every day and there are so many of us that lose our lives. I will be facing a transplant eventually to to um, the only way that I'll survive and that's already been said it's gonna be two years or less before we're at that point. We uh, try to raise money because I have to go to different states to get proper care because I don't live in a great state for that but the point is is that gastroparesis there's no cure it's a management kind of thing you can't live on central lines if people go past J tubes and G tubes which still aren't fun they're yucky I'm not gonna lie and they can be painful but once you have like Hickman's and Picks and and ports and brobiacs and, and all that stuff you start running into serious infection risks infection risks where you get one infection and you die I've been septic eight times I've dealt with septic shock twice and it was scary to have a doctor at the foot of my bed telling me I was gonna die that I was no longer gonna be here and that my baby didn't have a mom anymore and my first thought was that my baby will, won't ever remember me. And I don't want that. So we fight. We stand together. We wear green. We fight for a cure. We fight for awareness. To stand up together and say, pay attention to this disease because it's killing people. And people aren't looking, they're not watching. They think that it can be cured by a neurostimulator, a gastric neurostimulator in your stomach, when in reality, if you look at the statistics, they're not that great. Most of them are removed from pain or, or malfunction. There's no cure for gastroparesis. There's no cure for short gut. They just start cutting out in my case they're cutting out dead intestines every time I go into surgery there's no cure and there's so many people fighting it mainly women but there are men too that are fighting it just as much who need people to stand up and say we need to do something before we lose more people I lost a very close friend of mine who fought a very hard battle who could not get nutrition she needed and she is gone at 27 years old I know another mother heart stopped she had three babies She survived to have three babies for her heart to stop, to not be able to raise her babies. Please, please fight this disease. Join GPACT. Go to gpact.org. Learn about gastroparesis. Learn about motility disorders. Learn.
the best way to raise awareness is to educate yourself so you can educate other people. So go do that, please. Because if you don't, there's no hope. This disease is deadly and it doesn't go away. It's painful. Please fight. Fight for us. We stand up and we fight for together. And I'm asking all of my brothers and sisters who are GPers to stand up and fight together because we're not alone. But also asking our caregivers, our friends, our our caregivers' friends, our caregivers' caregivers' friends. I, I don't care. Just educate yourself and tell somebody. Wear green on Friday. Wear green every day if you've got it. When people ask you, tell them the truth. Explain it. This little boy is here because of a miracle. I'm here because of a miracle. I'm kept alive by this. And I'm blessed with every day I have with my little boy. But we need to raise awareness. I don't have any life beyond being a mom to the best of my ability and being hooked up to things and wheelchairs. I was going to be a musician and I lost it. I lost it to anorexia and self-harm and then I got the diagnosis of GP when I recovered and I lost it to that. And I'm not going to get better with this unless we all raise awareness and we all find a cure so all of us have a fighting chance and I don't get any more emails about my friends dying that their heart stopped because of malnutrition or they couldn't handle the stress of it anymore I'm always praying for you my friends who are suffering and fighting and I pray for those of you who I hope watch the video and join our cause. Thank you and there will be more videos to come. If you don't like them, um, you don't have to watch, but I pray that you do.